southern states with a friend and it happened to be a Sunday morning. We decided that we would go to whatever church we came upon at church time, 11 o'clock. And we found a very tiny church out in the middle of a cornfield surrounded by a lot of beat up old cars and trucks and we had to get there by means of a very muddy track. And when we got there, the minister had already worked himself into a lather, even though he hadn't yet started his sermon, and he announced that there would be a quartet. Five people stood up <laughs> in the audience in various places, and it took quite a bit of whispered conversation to sort themselves out, and finally four went up on the platform. The pianist had obviously been taken completely by surprise, and she thumbed quickly through the hymn book to find a place. And when the four got over in front of the pulpit, a middle-aged lady who seemed to be more or less in charge said, y'all pray for us, we ain't never done this before. <laughs> and I feel a little bit like that this morning. I have never been introduced by my husband in that way. I have never spoken to a group even remotely like this group of OM people. During the last hour, I was overwhelmed at the cosmopolitan nature of this group. I really, I don't believe, I feel very sure that there is no other mission in the world that could even come close to having such a mixture. So it's a tremendous privilege. It is a first. I ain't never done this before. <laughs> and I hope that I will speak in such a way as to make myself understood. I'm amazed at the ability to speak English of all of you who do. Um, as you know, we Americans are hopeless at languages. We don't even speak English. <laughs> we speak American, which is a far cry. We don't ever learn any other languages, even though we study them in school. I don't know what's wrong with the American system of education, but no language teaching in school ever succeeds in teaching a person to speak a language. <laughs> we can occasionally, laboriously read a little bit, but we do not learn to speak, and so it's always quite overwhelming to us to come to Europe and find out that everybody seems to speak uh, at least some English, and most people speak very good English. So I'm very grateful for that. I'm glad we have a few that speak Spanish here because I can manage to get along a little bit in Spanish, but the other languages that I had to learn in Ecuador would do me no good anywhere except in the jungle of Ecuador. Lessons from my life. I feel at a disadvantage because some of you know some things about me. If you've read some of my books, I know absolutely nothing about you. But I can assume that we're all women, we're all human, we're all wives, M many of us are mothers and grandmothers, and so I think I can identify in some way with everyone here. I think if we share together some of our own life's experiences and link them to the scriptures, then they will be applicable to all of our lives. I always like to hear people's stories, and there are many speakers who can tell stories a whole lot better than I can, but sometimes they don't link them to scripture, and it's a little bit difficult to plug them in, as it were, to apply them specifically. So everything that I say, I trust that I will be able to link in some way to the word, so that you will know that it was in this particular situation, in this context, that I learned these particular principles from scripture. My theme is lessons from my life, my topics, as you know, the theme, excuse me, is a living sacrifice. And I'm sure that all of you recognize the scripture from which that comes, Romans 12, 1, that we are to present our bodies, a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, 
which is, as one translation puts it, an act of spiritual worship. Reasonable service is the old authorized version, but an act of spiritual worship. I wish we had time to ask all of you who speak foreign languages what translations you have and what the shade of meaning might be from those, but maybe we shouldn't take time for that this morning. But I'd like to read 2 Corinthians 4, verses 5 to 18. And I will be referring to this particular passage probably in all four of my talks. 2 Corinthians 4, verses 5 to the end of the chapter. It is not ourselves that we proclaim. We proclaim Christ Jesus as Lord and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For the same God who said out of darkness let light shine has caused his light to shine within us to give the light of revelation, the revelation of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. We are no better than pots of earthenware to contain this treasure. And this proves that such transcendent power does not come from us, but is God's alone. Hard pressed on every side, we are never hemmed in. Bewildered, we are never at our wit's end. Hunted, we are never abandoned to our fate. Struck down, we are not left to die. Wherever we go, we carry death with us in our body, the death that Jesus died, that in this body also life may reveal itself, the life that Jesus lives. For continually, while still alive, we are being surrendered into the hands of death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may be revealed in this mortal body of ours. Thus, death is at work in us and life in you. But the scripture says, I believed and therefore I spoke out, and we too in the same spirit of faith believe and therefore speak out. For we know that he who raised the Lord Jesus to life will with Jesus raise us too and bring us to his presence and you with us. Indeed, it is for your sake that all things are ordered so that as the abounding grace of God is shared by more and more, the greater may be the chorus of thanksgiving that ascends to the glory of God. No wonder we do not lose heart. Though our outward humanity is in decay, yet day by day we are inwardly renewed. Our troubles are slight and short-lived, and their outcome an eternal glory which outweighs them far. Meanwhile, our eyes are fixed not on the things that are seen, but on the things that are unseen. For what is seen passes away. What is unseen is eternal. Three things from my life. Number one, love and obedience, the earliest lessons that I had to learn. Number two, surrender. Number three, crucifixion. I grew up in a home where love and obedience went together. We children, there were six of us, knew very well that our parents loved us. We also knew very well that they expected obedience. And they expected instant obedience. We were punished as though we had disobeyed if we were delaying our obedience. My little granddaughter Christiana just a few months ago when she was four years old had been spanked three times in one day because she didn't come quickly. She also understood that delayed obedience would be treated as disobedience. On the fourth time when she was called it was time to go to church and everybody was out waiting by the car. They called Christiana and she came charging out the door just as fast as she could. 
With her Bible, her notebook, and her pen, she's four years old, mind you, she doesn't <laughs> read and write, her hair ribbons, her hair clips, her bracelets, her rings, her necklaces, whatever <laughs> else is essential for a four-year-old to go to church with. She hadn't been able to get them all on and together, but she was carrying them and these things were falling out of her arms and tears were pouring down her face. And she looked at her mother and she said, oh mama, if only Adam and Eve hadn't sinned. <laughs> We understood love, we understood obedience. My brother Tom was three years old when his favorite form of play was to take all of the paper bags out of the drawer in the kitchen where my mother kept them and spread them over the floor. Well, because Tom is number five out of six, my mother let him get away with things that we never got away with. I was number two. <laughs> And we never let our parents forget that, that they <laughs> were more lenient with the younger ones. But my mother did make one very stringent condition, and that was that when, the children, when Tommy took the bags out of the drawer, he must put them back in the drawer. She came into the kitchen one day, and there were the bags on the floor, but Tommy was not there. She found him in the living room where my father was playing the piano. She said, Tommy, I want you to come and put away the paper bags. And he looked up with a smile of seraphic sweetness. Mm -hmm. And he said, but I wanted to sing, Jesus loves me. <laughs> and my father took the opportunity then to press home a very important lesson that to, be, to obey is better than to sacrifice. I'm sure he put it in terms which were understandable to Tommy. It's no good talking about praising the Lord and praising the Lord and singing songs when we are being disobedient. One of the songs that we sang in our family prayers, which we had every morning, was Trust and Obey, an old gospel song that explains that there is no other way. And essentially, that covers all of the Christian life, doesn't it? People ask me, what in the world do you talk about when you travel all over the place, <laughs> dishing out stuff to people? What exactly do you talk about? Well, of course, I talk about many different topics, but the bottom line is always trust and obey. There is no other way. And if we were going to be loved, and if obedience was going to be expected of us, then we had to learn those lessons of trust and obedience. And I'm very grateful to God, more grateful than I can ever say, for the godly parents who reared us. I was born in Brussels. My parents were missionaries with the Belgian Gospel Mission for a short time, and then we went back to the States when I was five months old, so my visit there on Wednesday was the first time that I've ever seen it, really. And I think of the dedication of my parents in seeing to it that we had family prayers, not just once a day, but twice a day. They collected all six of us in one place at one time, and we had to shut up and sit down and sing a hymn. We sang one hymn every morning, all stanzas, and we went straight through a hymn book. We didn't skip any hymns, and we didn't skip any stanzas. I don't know whether we have any Baptists in this crowd, but in the States, a lot of the Baptists like to skip the third stanza. But we didn't do that. Then we listened to my father read the Bible, and then we all knelt as he led in prayer, and we prayed the Lord's Prayer together before we rushed off to school and work and whatever. Then in the evening after dinner, we had Bible reading and prayer again. Prayer and Bible reading had a very central place in our lives, and we also knew that our father was up every morning between 4.30 and 5 in order to spend time alone with God in his little study. And believe me, when children come to breakfast and they know that their father has already been praying for more than an hour for them and reading his Bible, it does make a difference. It makes a permanent kind of a difference. And so we knew that he prayed for us, we prayed together, and then they prayed individually with us when they put us to bed at night up until we were probably seven or eight years old. One or the other of our parents would come with us 
and pray again and sometimes read scripture again. So I'm very, very grateful for that kind of a background. As I think of the important aspects of a Christian life, I recognize that there is no substitute for that time with God. And I'm sure that most of us at some time or other in our Christian lives have felt that we weren't really getting anywhere in private devotional life, that it became a, a ritual and perhaps a meaningless routine, and we just wanted to skip it, and we probably have skipped it many times. Many times not because we deliberately meant to, but because it was impossible, and God knows all about the real impossibilities. But there have been plenty, plenty of times, I'm sure, when we were just bored or tired or fed up, and we just thought, really, is this necessary? And one of the things about my father's private prayer life was that he arranged for it and prepared for it. And people used to say to him, even back then, um, how do you do it? How do you manage to get up at 4.30 in the morning? Back in those days, nobody had ever th thought of the idea of mourning people. Nowadays, I'm told that according to psychologists, some of us are morning people and some of us are afternoon people, etc. cetera. Uh, I don't think my father had any idea which he was. He didn't get up because he felt like it. He got up because he needed to. And when people would say, how do you do it? His answer was very simple. He said, you have to start the night before. You must go to bed, which means that you must deny yourself some of the pleasures of social life that you might otherwise indulge in. And he prepared. We used to tease him about the fact that he would go into his study after supper and he would arrange his Bible and his notebook and his prayer lists and whatever spiritual reading he might be doing at that time. He always lined them up in very neat parallel lines and had his pencils sharpened and everything. Uh, obviously, he was a very methodical and organized person, and we're very grateful for that, too. But in whatever way it's necessary for you to arrange a time to be alone with God, then I urge you to make those arrangements whatever it takes. My heart particularly goes out to you young mothers. I'm very acutely aware of the demands on a young mother's time. I really never really learned, I never learned a whole lot about that simply because I only had one child. And at the time that she was very small, I had Indian helpers. And so when I go to visit my daughter Valerie in California and her children are ages 10, eight, five, three, and one, I'm very aware that it would be a total impossibility for her to set aside one particular time which would be guaranteed to be uninterrupted. There is no such time. But she did have the good sense at the very beginning when her first child was born to arrange a quiet hour in the afternoon. That hour had to be variable because the baby didn't always sleep at the same time. But as the children have grown up, they've understood that they must have a quiet hour. That doesn't mean they have to have their per own personal devotions the one-year-old, the three-year-old, the five-year-old, or even the ten-year-old. It's simply a quiet time, and each child is asked to be alone in his room. He may, he may not come out for drinks of water or trips to the bathroom or to say, Mommy, what shall I do now? It's a habit. It's one that they've taken for granted because they've never known anything else. And that hour, believe me, is a lifesaver. I was there a few months ago taking care of four of the five children while my daughter and her husband went away and took the nursing baby along with them. And I don't think I would have survived the week as a grandmother if it hadn't been for that quiet hour. And I didn't have to argue and persuade and wheedle and plead and beg the children to go into their rooms for the quiet hour. At two o'clock, it's quiet time. And this is a wonderful thing, not only for the poor mother or the grandmother, as the case may be, but for the children, that they learn to be silent, to occupy themselves happily if they want to. They may sleep, of course, but what child wants to sleep if he's given a choice? <laughs> but they must do something. They can read, they can play games, they can do something, but it has to be quiet. And so they, too, are being taught love and obedience. And arrangements have to be made. Valerie said that when her babies were nursing, of course, the schedule was not very regular, and sometimes she would have been up most of the night with one or more children. And so her five o'clock hour at which she aimed 
really was not possible for her to get up and so she would pray that the Lord would give her some unexpected time and she told me it was just amazing to her how, how often that happened that in some way that she couldn't possibly have arranged herself the Lord arranged a time for her to be alone with him other times she would pray that if God wanted her to get it up get up at some other time than five o'clock that he would waken her and sometimes she would be wakened at two o'clock in the morning she would get up read her Bible and pray and go back to bed and then find that at five o'clock several of the children were awake so you, you really don't know what God has up his sleeve the second lesson surrender and I'm skipping over a good many years but in the back of my consciousness there was this idea that Christians are supposed to surrender themselves to God and I can remember going to countless meetings in which this subject was preached on and there was an invitation given at the end who is willing to put everything on the altar and as a ten-year-old or an eight-year-old I can remember trying my hardest to think now what am I supposed to put on the altar I wasn't really very clear as to what this altar was and I didn't really know exactly what it was that I had to offer and it didn't really come clear for many many years it's only now beginning to come a little bit clearer and I'm 60 years old so these lessons I wouldn't want to present them as being things which I have mastered but the idea of surrender one way in which it came through to me very loud and clear was through missionary books and because my parents had been missionaries and we entertained missionaries by the thousands in our home and we went to missionary meetings and we read missionary books and we looked at dreadful missionary slides <laughs> back in those days they were pretty bad lantern slides anybody here old enough to remember them I'm probably the oldest person in the room oh here's one that's not as old as I am but she does remember lantern slides they were dreadful anyway because of that we all we sort of thought and ate and drank and slept missionaries but one of them that I remember when I was probably only four or five was a woman named Betty Scott Stam she was Betty Scott when she came to our home and she stayed overnight and she was on her way to China where she married her fiance John Stam I don't remember her visit very vividly but I do remember very vividly a few years later when my father came home with a newspaper from Philadelphia telling about Betty Scott Stam and John having been captured by Chinese communists and marched half naked through the streets of their village and Betty was forced to watch as the communists chopped her husband's head off and then she too had to lay her neck on the chopping block and she was beheaded when I was about 12 I came across a prayer that Betty Scott Stam had written and it has become a prayer of my life Lord I give up all my own plans and purposes all my own desires and hopes and accept thy will for my life I give myself my life my all utterly to thee to be thine forever fill me with thy Holy Spirit use me as thou wilt send me where thou wilt work out thy whole will in my life at any cost now and forever and you can imagine the impact that that incident had on my childish mind and the meaning that was then instilled into those words of total surrender and that was the prayer that I began to pray I copied it into my Bible when I was about 12 and I've been praying it ever since work out thy whole will in my life at any cost now and forever that is surrender and if you're as confused and as vague about just exactly what the word means and what it is that you're supposed to lay on the altar I remember hearing the story about a little boy who had been singing that song I surrender all and his mother heard him muttering everything except my baby bunny and that was the way I tried to look at it uh, am I supposed to give up this book or this doll or this dress or this hair ribbon or what is it 
And God is not necessarily asking us to give up anything to begin with, except the right to ourselves, which is everything, isn't it? Jesus said, if you want to be my disciple, you must give up your right to yourself. I realize that I'm speaking to a very highly specialized audience this morning, and I don't think I need to ring the changes on that elementary principle. But is there ever a day in the lives of any of us, no matter how many years we've walked with the Lord, when we don't have to face that issue again? Give up my right to myself. And that is basically what surrender is. I don't have any rights because I have turned them over voluntarily, gladly, as an offering, a living sacrifice. If I present my body, then I am presenting everything it contains, am I not? My mind, my heart, my emotions, my temperament, my personality, my prejudices, my thinking, my tastes, my preferences. I have surrendered the rights to all of that in making this living sacrifice. And although we may say that it is a once in a lifetime commitment, and we set our face like a flint to do his will, every single day that commitment is going to be tested in some way. The Lord comes to us and he says, you trusted me there, you trusted me there, you followed me here, what about here? What about now? What about in this tiny thing? which may seem so trivial and insignificant. Will you give up your right to yourself? Surrender means cooperation with God. It means waiting on God. And it means trust. In verse 15 that we read, Paul says, it is for your sake that all things are ordered. I love that phrase. It is for your sake that all things are ordered. Whenever things happen which are not according to the way we would have ordered them, let's remember that some of God's greatest mercies are his refusals. He orders everything for our sake. And if he had allowed us to order them the way we think they should work, we would not be blessed. We would not be taught. We would not be given the opportunities to surrender and to make that fresh commitment every day. Yes, Lord. Jesus said, you must give up your right to yourself, you must take up your cross, and you must follow daily. And that means no to myself, yes to God, and daily obedience, walking one step at a time in obedience. As I said earlier, I don't know anything about any of you, except the things which I would take for granted, since we're all women and we're all wives. And so I don't know specifically what the questions of your life are. I can guess that Many of you have come to this conference with very deep needs, very big questions, hoping, praying, longing for something. And if I knew all those needs and all their, those questions, do you think I could possibly stand up here and speak at all? Of course not. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know that need. Some of you have something deep down that you probably can't mention to anybody, not even your husband. Some of you have something which perhaps to you seems so ridiculously silly that you would be embarrassed to mention it, but it's something that is really a pain. If I knew all those things, I couldn't speak to you. I cannot say I know exactly what you're going through. I can't say that. But you know what I can say? With absolute assurance, I know the one who knows. 
and I know where he has met me. Then, well, I've made a list in the front of my Bible. I've been making the list. It's not complete yet, and it would be worth your while to make a similar list as I've been studying. I write down the questions that people raised to God. And let me just read this through very quickly. Don't try to take, take down, I won't even give you the references, but most of them I'm sure are familiar with to you. For example, can God spread a table in the wilderness? Where can we buy bread? Who will roll away the stone? What is the good of that for such a crowd? How can I save Israel? How can a man be born when he is old? How can you give me living water? How can this man give us his flesh to eat? How is it that this untrained man can teach? O oh, Master, which way are we to turn? Why wait any longer for him to help us? Even if the Lord were to open windows in the sky, how was the Lord to save Jerusalem? Is this your care for the widow? Can these bones live again? Has your God been able to save you from the lions? That's just an incomplete list. But I'm sure that every one of us has raised questions which would fall under one or, one or the other of those categories. We need to learn to trust. That's what it's about. And trusting means in the context of your life. Whatever your country, whatever the needs of the particular work that you're in, whoever those unget along withable people may be that you have to work with, it's there and it is nowhere else that God wants to meet you. It's there that he's asking for that living sacrifice. I'm sure that we're all tempted at one time or another to think, well, if I had her job or her talents or maybe even her husband, I mean, God forbid, <laughs> her circumstances, her advantages, then maybe I could serve the Lord. But this place with these people and my limitations, I don't have any gifts. You know, when you say I don't have any gifts, that is a slap in the face at the giver. Because the Bible tells us that we all have gifts, plural. We all have them for the sake of the body. They're not given to us for ourselves. God doesn't give us any gift just for ourselves. It's for the sake of the body. And we're going to be thinking about some of what those gifts are in our next talk, what we receive. But it is within the context that you are right now. It is this place where all things are ordered for your sake. It is precisely there and nowhere else that God is saying to you, will you trust me? Will you cooperate with me? Will you wait for me? Will you obey me? Trust and obey. That's what surrender is about. Cooperation, waiting, trusting, and <coughs> obeying. And thirdly, crucifixion. And this passage brings out so graphically, to me this has been perhaps the most helpful passage in understanding what the crucified life is about. I grew up living near a place called Keswick, New Jersey. You English people know Keswick, England, and of course we have several Keswicks in America and Canada, which are offshoots from Keswick, England. For any who might not be familiar with the name, Keswick is a place in England where there was a great tent campaign begun back in the 1800s, which is still going on. It's only a one-week thing, I think, a uh, very large gathering. And the message which was preached there was what was called the crucified life. And that message was brought to the United States, and several conference grounds were founded. And so I grew up in the sound of that word, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. That's Galatians 2.20. But I think Paul makes it a little bit clearer here what that's all about. 
he describes some of his own feelings. We're hard pressed, we're bewildered, we're hunted, we're struck down. But he says, we're never hemmed in, we are never at our wit's end, we are never abandoned to our fate, we are not left to die. Sometimes we even feel as though those things are true of us. But when we do that, when we feel that way, then we've forgotten that all things are ordered for our sakes. We're not at the mercy of chance. It is precisely here where we are to die this particular kind of death, whatever this death may be. We die a thousand deaths, little deaths. But it is in order that, not in order that we be dead, but in order that the life of Jesus might be manifest in us. And here he says uh, in verse 11, continually while still alive, we are being surrendered into the hands of death for Jesus' sake. Now maybe some of you read that passage thinking that that meant that Paul was always getting arrested and threatened with death. Well, that would certainly be part of it, but that's not all. Continually, we are always being surrendered into the hands of death, given the chance to say no to myself and yes to God. That's death. That is accepting the cross. A cross is something you can evade. We can all get out of it if we want to. It's when we offer ourselves willingly and gladly and say, yes, Lord, if this is what you want to give me, if this is what you want to receive from me, I'll offer it. I'll take what you give me and I will offer it back to you. I will die this death for your sake. What's it for? That the life of Jesus may be revealed in this mortal body of ours. I wish we had time to hear testimonies from you of the people whose lives have most greatly influenced your own spiritually. And I'm sure that there would be a great variety. I've mentioned one of my spiritual mothers. I would count Amy Carmichael as a spiritual mother because she was far more to me than a role model. She was a mother. She showed me what godly womanliness is all about and what the life of the cross means. But in every case, I'm sure if we could hear your stories, we would see individuals who have suffered in order that the life of Jesus might be manifest in a great variety of mortal bodies. I was fascinated as I sat here this morning watching the parade that came past this microphone of what a great variety of types of people we have. What a variety of clothing and style and accents. Isn't it incredible? Just imagine the variety that God in his imagination, in his incredible creative imagination, conceived. And he allows himself to be represented in these mortal bodies. To me, that's just staggering that he, almighty God, the Lord of the universe, is content to dwell in you and me. Why didn't he send angels to do the job that O.M. has to do? Why did he limit himself to us feeble, frail, sinful women? It was grace, wasn't it? It was grace and there are many other mysteries that we can't plumb. All we know is that he has chosen to be represented in the lives of us ordinary women. Time, okay, she's gonna turn over the tape here. Pause for technology. Thus, death is at work in us and life in you. I'd like for us to think during these two days about the connections between marriage and discipleship, there are a great many, and I hope I'll remember to come back to this again and again. I'm absolutely fascinated with the fact that God chose to use the marriage relationship between a man and a woman as the closest representation of what discipleship is about, what the relationship between God and his people is about. He calls himself the bridegroom of Israel, 
And of course, Christ is the bridegroom in the New Testament and the church is his bride. And when you and I get married, when we got married, we stood in front of God and witnesses and we made some breathtaking vows. We said some very solemn things which none of us could possibly imagine. Uh, we, we could not imagine the implications that these things were going to have. Any more than when I was 12 years old and said, Lord, I give up all my own plans and purposes and accept thy will for my life. Did I know what that was going to mean? Did Betty Scott Stam know what that was going to mean? When I stood up in front of witnesses and said, I take thee, Lars, to be my wedded husband, for better or for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, till death us do part. Did I know what that was going to involve? Did I know this man that I was committing myself to? My mother used to say, you don't really know your husband until you've been married five years. So by those terms, I never knew numbers one and two. <laughs> I didn't make it through five years. But I've gotten to know Lars a little better. And although I thought, as you undoubtedly thought when you married your husband, that he was a prize package. He turns out to be a surprise package. <laughs> and there are all kinds of things which you didn't expect. Now when the Lord comes to you and says, will you follow me? Do you want to be my disciple? And you say, oh yes, Lord, I'll follow you, as Peter said, into prison and into death. And God knows right away that you don't have a clue what you're talking about. That bride doesn't have a clue whether it's going to be better or worse, richer or poorer, in sickness and in health, and if it, if it turns out to be worse, poorer, and sickness, she's going to say, well, I didn't expect this. I didn't know it was going to amount to this. And when God does things in your life that were not on your program, What's the first question that pops into your mind? Why? And things happened in my very first year as a missionary, which prompted that question. Just to give you a very brief br view of the first year, there were three major blows to my faith before I had been a missionary, one year in the jungle. First of all, I was reducing an unwritten language to writing the Colorado Indian language of Western Ecuador. I needed an informant, somebody who would be willing to sit down and have the patience to repeat and repeat and repeat words so that I could repeat them after him and then write them down and develop an alphabet and go from there. And Macadio was the answer to many prayers. He was not only fluent in Colorado, he didn't happen to be a Colorado Indian, but to my surprise I found an Ecuadorian white man who spoke Colorado, he was the only one who did, and he spoke Spanish, so it was a great advantage to me to be able to <coughs> communicate with him in Spanish and then he could translate into Colorado. But we hadn't been working together very many weeks when Macadio was murdered. There was nobody else, literally nobody else in the world that spoke both Spanish and Colorado. So my first question, of course, was, why, Lord? Why would you allow this one man who could help me in a way that nobody else could do to be killed? And all of us have faced experiences for which we can find no explanation, humanly speaking. And we look into that abyss, and there is no glimmer of light there is no faintest answer to the question except the still small voice that says, trust me, I do know what I'm doing. And you only have two choices when you face the inexplicable. You either trust God or you don't. He either is God and he is in charge and he knows exactly what he's doing and he's got the whole world where? In his hands. Or he isn't God. He doesn't know what he's doing. He doesn't have the whole world in his hands, and I am at the mercy of chance. And so, of course, at that point, I had to choose to trust him. Then a few months later, when I had much more laboriously than I would have if Macadio had lived, 
by the end of about a year, I had reduced the language to writing. All of my materials were in a suitcase, and the suitcase was stolen. There were no copies, there were no Xeroxes in those days, and there were no tape recorders. All the charts, all the notebooks, all the three by five cards, everything was stolen. Now, of course, God knew where that suitcase was, and so we prayed that God would bring it back. And guess what? He didn't bring it back. <laughs> Why, Lord? And he says, trust me. Didn't you ask for my will? And I said, yes, Lord. Work out thy whole will in my life at any cost. And a few months, a few weeks after that, I got a letter from my fiance, Jim Elliott, who was working on the other side of the Andes in the eastern jungle, telling me that the entire station on which he had spent that first year had just been demolished by a flood. All the buildings, five of them, three of which he had built with his own hands, two of which he had repaired that had been greatly dilapidated, they all went down the Amazon in one night. When we surrender, we agree for life to cooperate, to wait, and to trust. And it is in those deaths that we give up our right to ourselves, we take up the cross, and we follow. Every day, there is some kind of a death. Continually, while still alive, we are being surrendered into the hands of death. But don't ever forget why. It's not because God wants us dead. It's in order that the life of Jesus may be manifest. In order that I may be a visible, walking, breathing, living representation of these tremendous eternal truths. Most of us know, missionaries know, that most of your time is not spent actually speaking to some individual about the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you were to total up all the hours that you've ever spent doing precisely that, as opposed to all the hours that you've been sound asleep, and all the hours that you've been toiling away in what might have been for you an inconvenient kind of a kitchen or laundry or whatever, all the time that it takes you to travel and to shop and take care of your children and do whatever you need to be, whatever you need to do for your husband and all of those other things, it would be a very pitiful amount of time, wouldn't it? That would actually be what we think of sometimes as the work of God. But Paul was able to say continually, while still alive, we are being surrendered into the hands of death. There is always the opportunity to trust him to be crucified with Christ, to give up our right to ourselves. Death is at work in us and life in you. We are being surrendered for Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus also may be revealed in this mortal body of ours. Let me go back over the three points. I always like to tell people what I'm going to say, then I try to say it, and then I'll try to remember to tell you what I've said, so that there may be a little bit closer relationship between what I mean to say, what I actually say, what you think you heard me say, and what you got in your notebook. Not to mention what you report to your husband when he says, what in the world did that woman talk about? The theme is a living sacrifice. This talk is lessons from my life, and those lessons are love and obedience under number one, Number two, surrender. And number three, crucifixion. God bless you.